If you were expecting Ian this morning, um, this is me, I'm not Ian. Um, Amazon is still tweeting, celebrating Ian for talking this morning, so he's stealing all of my Twitter karma, um, but that's okay. Um, we have two sessions this morning. Um, you're stuck with me for both of them. Uh, the first one is going to be a little bit more introductory. Uh, we're going to talk about getting started with AWS Lambda and serverless. Um, we are on Twitch today, um, so if you're following along at home, um, our helpful moderators will be there to help answer some of your questions. Um, if you are here live, um, we'll do some questions if we have time at the end. But as always, um, if you want to line up, uh, we'll handle some questions uh, offline afterwards as well. Um, so without further ado, before I get a warning about staying on time again, um, so a couple of compute offerings. So serverless is something that's, I think, it's, it's popped up a lot recently. Um, it's really popular. It's really trendy. We can read a lot of blog posts about it, um, where I think uh, the, the differences for some people is, is what are the differences between the different kinds of compute offerings? So we're going to start off with some of that, and then we'll dive into to Lambda and serverless. Um, EC2 is the, kind of the traditional OG one, so virtual servers in the cloud. Um, I think at least three of the questions last week um, were about, OK, what about ECS and what about Lambda? And can I not just replace my whole infrastructure and ECS cluster with Lambda? And the answer is, I guess maybe, if you really wanted to, but it would be hard, and you'd be very sad when you were doing it. Uh, so some differences, ECS, uh, container management service for running Docker containers on EC2. Um, we gave a couple of sessions about that last week. Uh, today we're talking about Lambda, so serverless compute platform uh, for stateless code execution. So uh, quick and dirty answer, you run your code uh, in response to events. So those events can come from a bunch of different places. Uh, usually other AWS services, so Kinesis or DynamoDB or S3, um, you can run your Lambda function, so your code, uh, in response to those events without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Um, so some benefits of, of Lambda. Um, this was not Ian's slide deck. He doesn't use emojis like this, so I made it. Um, but the, one of the benefits, and it's the same benefit, I think, to, to ECS, is that a ton of people are using it right now. It's a space that's really interesting. Um, so you can see some really, cool, some really cool projects that come up with it, and a lot of people talking. So there's a really, there's a really rich ecosystem right now around serverless and, and ECS. So, uh, so Trendy is good, but there are, I guess, some, some actual benefits as well. Um, so the, the big thing is it's serverless. So what is serverless? Because there's always someone that says, but it's not serverless, because you have to use server somewhere. And that is true. Uh, it's a dirty secret. So there are servers, but you don't have to manage the servers. Uh, so that's what serverless is. Uh, continuous scaling. Um, so you can scale up uh, in response to what your usage is. So uh, what do you actually need? Uh, what kind of resources do you need and scale up accordingly? Uh, and then no idle cold servers. So uh, with the kind of the traditional way of doing things, uh, those servers belong to you, right? So you can uh, you run your infrastructure, you run your application on the infrastructure, and if your if your traffic is really busy and maybe you're using all of your resources, great. Uh, but if it's not, uh, those servers are kind of still being managed by you. So even if you're not running anything on them, uh, you're still you're still paying for the usage time. Um, so Lambda gets rid of that, uh, so you don't have to pay for things that are idle. You don't pay for servers when you're not using them. Uh, you only pay for the execution time, um, so, which is per request. Um, so you buy compute time in the uh, 100 millisecond instruments, um, so really small request charge, uh, no minimums, no per device fees, um, never pay for idle. Um, Lambda and a bunch of other services ha have a pretty extensive free tier. Uh, so the free tier for AWS, um, you hear about it a lot, probably at hackathons and loft events. Um, but it's what can you use as part of a service to try it out before you, uh, before it becomes like a charging per per second or per or per request. Uh, so the free tier for Lambda, uh, one million requests and four hundred thousand gigabytes of compute every month for every customer. Um, so. There's a, there's a ton of documentation out there for the free tier as well. So I'm mentioning the Lambda one, but other services have free tiers too. Um, so if you hear about something cool at a loft or online or at a hackathon uh, and you want to try it uh, before you kind of start building on top of it extensively, um, start with the free tier and look up what kind of usage you can get uh, just to test things out. Um, so working with Lambda, um, we're going to walk through kind of how you work with it, and then we'll get a little bit more specific. Uh, but number one, so bring your own code. Um, so you write your own function. You can use Node.js. You can use Java, Python, uh, C Sharp. Uh, 
you can bring your own libraries also. Um, so there's some couple, there are a couple things though that are included uh, in kind of the runtime that you can use, that you can run those functions in. Um, so some of the SDKs are already there for you so you don't have to worry about bringing them. Um, simple resource model. So part of serverless is that you shouldn't be spending a lot of time worrying about how to allocate your resources. Um, you can select the power rating for your function. Um, you allocate CPU and network, um, and then your metrics show how much you're using. Um, so you can, you can tweak those numbers yourself also. Um, so flexible use. Um, so you can call or you can send other events. Um, I think that the integrated with other AWS services kind of comes uh, without saying. Uh, so generally, uh, one of your inputs, so one of the most popular inputs uh, for running the Lambda functions is gonna be from the other AWS services. So from a, an update in S3, an update in Dynamo, uh, events written to a stream in Kinesis. Um, you can build whole serverless ecosystems. So there's actually some cool case studies um, on, the, on the Lambda section of the website. Um, so I think, I think it's Bustle, um, but they basically wrote their backend using Lambda. Um, so uh, when they get events in, when they need to do like friendless updates or something like that, um, it's just a function, so a Lambda function. So they wait for the updates, uh, they run their function, and then they can send out uh, notifications or, or friendless updates in response to that. Um, some other really cool, uh, really cool ones up there also. Um, flexible authorization. So um, we talked about this for talked about this for ECS last week too, and I think it's I think this kind of goes for the same larger shift. Uh, so we're we're moving a lot of the permissions down from just at the server level uh, down to the function or the container level. Um, so just like ECS has the per task has the per task um, the the per task rules. Uh, Lambda can use the roles per function also. So if you have one function that needs to have access to DynamoDB and S3, but one function that only needs to have access to Kinesis, um, you can do that. So you have really fine-grained control over who and what can call your functions, um, and you can grant access to resources that way also, uh, so including VPCs. Um, I mentioned I stole my own thunder again, but uh, AWS SDK is built in already. Um, front end is Lambda. Uh, you can use processes, threads, temp, sockets the same way that you normally would. A um, couple ways of authoring functions. So you can do it right in the console. So before everyone tells me that the console isn't cool, it is. Um, so write your function there. Um, there's a little editor there. You can go through the whole process just kind of writing, testing, debugging uh, in the console. Uh, you can also package your code as a zip file, upload to Lambda or S3. Um, there are plugins for some IDEs, uh, and there are command line tools. So work with and author functions, uh, whichever way works for you. Uh, you can either write them there, or you can upload them, uh, and then you can, uh, you can use them. Um, stateless. So part of the, the trade-off, I think, is for, or it's not even a trade-off, really, but if you're, if you're trying to customize your infrastructure, so there's no affinity to infrastructure here. So you can't SSH in to debug your Lambda functions. You can't customize the host that it's running on. Uh, functions are stateless. So if you need to persist data, so if you need state uh, in any way, uh, persist it somewhere else. So S3, RDS, Elasticash, uh, whatever. But don't count on your, on your functions kind of keeping everything. So, We'll go a little bit more into specific detail, but you only get a certain amount of space that your function can use while it's running. Um, not maybe a great substitute for state, but if you need something during your actual execution, you have it. Um, and then there is some, some reuse, so sometimes things are used in the same containers. Um, so you should write your function accordingly, but don't do state. So don't do anything that you kind of uh, assume that you'll have the, the same container uh, or that you'll have state left over from your function. Uh, monitoring and logging, um, same kind of deal as a lot of the newer services. It's built in with CloudWatch, um, so the metrics and alarms are already there for you. Um, built, in, uh, built in metrics for a couple of the things that I think are important to the Lambda function specifically, so requests, latency, errors, and throttles. Um, some common use cases, I only did a couple of them. Um, we already talked about the serverless backends with, with Bustle. Um, but uh, data triggers, I think, is a really big one. So um, in my, one of my side projects is, if you've ever seen a, a series, it's called This Is My Architecture. Um, there's videos on, on YouTube, but it's basically AWS customers talking about 
uh, talking about what they've built with, with AWS and in a lot of cases, why they've built it, so what problems they're trying to solve. And I would say that hands-on, the most popular use that I see for people doing, uh, writing these Lambda functions is, is kind of like glue. Um, so they have either a task that used to be, a, a human used to do it, so like taking a file, getting it from something else and uploading it somewhere else, or I need to know every time a new file's uploaded to this bucket, so I wrote some logic there. Um, hands down, the most common one I see is, okay, so I have something and I'm waiting for an update, and when something changes with thing A, I need someone else or thing B to know about it. Um, so you see a lot of people using it to kind of handle those little tasks, right? So uh, I have an update, I need to notify someone, I need to update this field when this other thing happens. Uh, it's really powerful for things like that, uh, especially when it used to be that a person had to sit and do it. So, hey, now I know that we have an update here, so I'm going to go send an email to this other person. Um, big data. Um, so uh, you can have your streaming data updates through Kinesis, um, control systems. So same thing, right? So something's happened, something's changed in part A, uh, so I need to make an update or I need to make a change in part B. So customize your responses, your workflows uh, to state changes within AWS itself. Um, so when is Lambda not the right choice? Um, so we've actually kind of covered some of these, not explicitly but implicitly, uh, but when, when is Lambda not the right choice for you? So a um, person that asked me last week whether they could rewrite everything in Lambda, this one's for you. Um, if you need to manage your own compute resources, so if you need to customize your infrastructure, if you need to choose a very specific resource type, uh, if you need to get really specific and you need to choose those things yourself, uh, perhaps Lambda is not the right tool for your project. Go with EC2. Uh, go with something else where you can customize uh, the infrastructure yourself. Um, if you need more than 500 megabytes in temp, so I said earlier that you get some space that your function can use uh, while it's executing. Um, that is it. Um, so if you need more space than that, or if you need to hand handle actual state, um, maybe pick a different tool. Uh, if you need a long running job, uh, so the timeout on Lambda functions execution time um, has gotten a little bit longer. I think it's 300 seconds now. Um, but if you need a job that's running longer than that, uh, Perhaps, perhaps this is not the right one either. Or again, I've mentioned this a couple times, but if you need state or, or persistence. Um, so some more specific use cases. Um, the slides, like for all these sessions, are going to be available up um, online after this. So if, you are, if, you're, if the, the font is a little too small to see on some of these, the slides will go up. So you can look at the architecture diagrams uh, in your own time. Uh, but a couple of examples, so dynamic data ingestion with Lambda and S3 um, is the same thing that we really just talked about, right? So I have a new object that's uploaded, I put it in S3, uh, Lambda processes the object, um, sees that we have a new update in S3, um, and then we can either, we can store our processed object to S3, and then we can upload our metadata to DynamoDB. So just a, a little bit more specific example of what we were just kind of talking about more generally, right? So I have a thing, I have a file that's, uplo up, that's, that's uploaded. I need to do some logic on that file. So Lambda runs the logic and then both up stores it's the, the process version, so the, the file version with the logic applied back to S3 uh, and then sends the file metadata to DynamoDB. So a lot like glue here still too, right? So uh, I get my update, I run my, I apply my logic and then I make some changes afterwards. Um, so I, had, I, I added some customer examples in here, in here also. Um, the, the longer version of a lot of these is, is in the case studies. So if you, wanna, if you wanna get really specific or you say, oh, actually, I wanna do that too, um, a bunch of these people have written case studies on, on what they do. Um, but what are customers using S3 and Lambda for? So apply custom logic to process content being uploaded into S3. So exactly what we just showed, I'm sure their architecture maybe looks a little bit more exciting than my diagram. Um, but so applying a watermark, um, I think actually one of the, the, in the Lambda documentation, the example function uh, is making, is creating thumbnails uh, with Lambda from the file upload. Um, so I think it's in there because a lot of people are already doing it. Um, transcoding files, indexing, uh, deduplication, uh, filtering, 
basic content validation, basically making changes, validating, doing something in response to files being uploaded in S3. Lambda does the logic, and then we can either store that version somewhere else, we can upload it somewhere else, we can send a notification. Um, Lambda and Kinesis, so streaming. Um, so another flow showing d uh, data ingestion with S3 and Kinesis. So same kind of thing. Uh, new data is available. It goes to Kinesis. Uh, Lambda processes the stream in Kinesis. And then we take kind of two actions here. So we compress the data and we dump it to CloudWatch logs. Uh, and then we filter our data and we alert SNS. So a, maybe a little bit more involved version, but we have a, we have a new upload. Uh, it goes to Kinesis, Lambda's watching Kinesis. It runs in response to that new, that new data being available. And then we take two actions on it. We send our data to CloudWatch logs, and then we're, we're filtering, we're looking for something, some specific characteristic, and then we're, we're alerting SNS. So the, the implication here is that once I've alerted SNS, um, someone else or something else is going to get the notification from SNS. Um, same kind of deal, so some customer examples using Lambda and Kinesis. Um, so same, same kind of thing. So you have custom logic that you're applying to the data that's being uh, run through your Kinesis stream. Uh, so activity tracking, uh, generating metrics, so you can watch your stream for something specific and you can increment your metrics that way. Uh, cleaning or filtering data, uh, log filtering, indexing, alarms. So pretty much same kind of deal. We're watching, there's a theme here, right? So we're watching the data, whether it's in S3 or Kinesis or Dynamo. We're watching it, we're looking for something specific or we're taking an action every time. Uh, and then we're doing something in response to that change that we're watching for. Um, so Lambda powered APIs. So theoretically, I guess, if you wanted to run your whole backend in Lambda and you were a consenting adult, you could do that. Um, so you're getting data from a bunch of services, right? So a mobile app, a website, a backend service. Uh, I really like when we make diagrams and we just use a cloud and we put internet. Um, makes me really happy. Um, so data goes through CloudFront. Um, if you've used CloudFront in the past, um, basically you can use it to route where your data goes. Um, and then in this case, we're sending it back to API Gateway. We're, sending some, we're doing some monitoring through CloudWatch. Uh, we're caching. Uh, and then our back end, which is, I don't have a laser pointer. I'm not sure where everyone I work with is getting the laser pointers for. I've never thought that I needed one, but apparently I do. Um, it goes through our API gateway, and then we do our back ends, right? So we have our, our Lambda functions, which are handling some functions. And we don't really know what they are in this case, but it could be processing. It could be updates. Um, we have some endpoints in EC2. Um, but basically, you can replace some of what is, and where I actually see people using this a lot, right, is if you're, if you're kind of starting maybe a small demo project or you're doing a mobile app and either you're a small team or maybe there's just one of you and previously it used to be, okay, well, I can do all the, I can do the mobile part myself or I can make the website myself. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm really great at React and HTML and CSS, and I can make my own website, and it can be really awesome, but what happens when I need to do anything more complicated on the back end? So what happens when I actually need to do stuff that happens on servers, and it is a big mystery to me, and what I, but I, I'm doing what I'm good at, but I need something else to kind of handle the logic on the, on the back end, and that's where I see a lot of people making really cool projects with Lambda, right, is that they can, they, they already know how to do these other pieces, but they need something else to handle the logic for them. Uh, so then you can really do that without having a whole lot of, I guess, what is traditionally kind of a, like a back-end engineer or a DevOps person to, to help you out, is that you can write these functions, so you could write it in Node or whatever, but you don't have to worry about, okay, so I provision servers, and now I have auto-scaling groups, and now I need high availability, and now I need all of these things, when really all I wanted was a mobile app. Um, so for a lot of people, Lambda, Lambda fits that need for them. Um, so the same kind of thing that we were just talking about. No backend experience, no problem. Um, so you can use Lambda. Uh, you can personalize it pretty easily. Um, I imagine that this diagram is going to be pretty hard to see. Um, this is a really giant screen. Um, but basically, same kind of thing that we were just talking about. So I have some logic that I need to do, or I need to personalize it based on who's looking at it. Um, I need to do different things for different people. Um, I can do that back end with Lambda, uh, and I can focus on my, on my app. Uh, and let Lambda worry about the back end part. Uh, some other use cases. So I've had a lot of questions about this one actually, and it's usually 
It's usually in the ECS context, which is, so I don't have, this is maybe the most popular one, is I don't have a traditional web app, or I have a traditional web app, but I'm handling it some other way. Uh, but I have some other things, so some other jobs that I used to run uh, using cron uh, and Linux, but I've gotten to the point now where I'm not SSHing onto my servers. So I'm not writing custom logic on the servers that make up my pool, whether it's for ECS or whatever I'm doing. So, but I'm not fitting the use case that most of the documentation is for, right? Which is uh, I've, I have my new thing. Um, so I think most of the documentation is okay. So you have a web app and you're trying to write it to either use to use ECS, you're trying to rewrite some of the endpoints to use Lambda. Um, but you don't fit that. So I have to do some other things that used to involve kind of SSHing on somewhere and writing cron jobs. So uh, you can do both of them with either ECS or Lambda. Uh, to do it in Lambda, so you, you can do scheduled events. So start or stop an environment at a specific time. Uh, so clean up logs, uh, run batch data jobs. So kick off a job in response to something else. Um, alarm clock, uh, infrastructure automation. So spin something up. Uh, when something else needs to start, um, schedule your backups. Um, tons of tons of kind of the smaller the smaller jobs that you would use to kind of schedule yourself. Uh, you can use something else to schedule them now, uh, so that you don't have to to SSH and, and handle them. Um, backup and disaster recovery. So um, a couple use cases for this. So when I have a picture of the blog post, by the way, I've included uh, links to the compute blog at the end. Um, so uh, if you want to actually read the blog post, which is probably a lot more successful than reading the picture and the slideshow, um, there are links. Uh, and I'll send around links and stuff afterwards. Um, but there's, a really cool, there's, some, there's some really cool articles about there about, about what people are doing, right? So that backups, uh, part of the thing is that you never know whether your backup actually works or not until you've tried to use your backup. And then in some cases, Maybe you find out in an emergency type of situation that your backup does not, in fact, work. Um, so uh, <clears throat> part of what I think people are using Lambda for that is really interesting is you can set the rules in Lambda to define uh, what needs to be checked and what needs to be backed up. So if you're missing something, uh, if your backup wouldn't pass validation, uh, you, can, you can check that with Lambda, and then you can alert when it fails validation. So it won't totally rescue you from the, well, I have my backup. And everyone has been here. And if, you've, if you are telling me that you haven't, then we're all lying to each other. Um, but everyone has enabled backups in Postgres or something and then been like, I have backups. I'm great. And then it's like, well, now it happens. So now my database is gone. And now it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And now everyone's really angry with me. And I don't actually know, I don't actually know how to apply my, apply my backups. Um, because in a lot of cases, maybe something's changed. Maybe you're not backing up that one field that you thought was really not that important, but turns out everything else is based on that one field. Um, use Lambda to check and validate it and let you know. Uh, it won't save you the whole way, but it might rescue you from a couple of scenarios. Um, some other resources. So uh, I, we, I, so the session after this is me also, and I've included maybe a little bit more specific. Um, I have some coworkers that really love that really love Lambda. That do a lot of talking about it. That do a lot of projects on it. Um, one of those is Randall. Um, he has a ton. So if anyone's been following along, he's built a lot of these on he's built a lot of these on Twitch. So uh, if you follow him on Twitter, he has like a days till reinvent countdown calendar. Um, so he has a ton of projects out there. Um, he uses Lambda a lot, and he uses it for a lot of very devious things. Um, so. Uh, some great examples to look at. There's some case studies that we that we spoke about. Um, also, uh, the documentation is also there. Um, the compute blog post. So the two examples that I had, just kind of the screenshots of for illustration purposes. Those are actual real life compute blog posts. Um, so uh, go through them, check them out. Those and the case studies, and then. Um, I talk about ECS a lot, um, but there are people that are just like me that talk about Lambda all the time and write really cool projects. Um, so tons of resources out there if you're looking to, to kind of get started. Um, we have some time left in between now um, and the next session. So uh, if you have any questions, you can either send them through on Twitch. Um, the next session, by the way, will still be Lambda and serverless focused. 
uh, will be a little bit more technical, so we'll talk about some architectural patterns. Um, I know it's kind of early to talk about ar architectural patterns, but such is life. Um, I'll take questions now, or some of my colleagues will take questions now, um, or uh, in general, if you want to ask questions and you don't want to do them on Twitch or in front of the room, um, we'll stand over there and, and take questions for a couple minutes in between sessions also. Um, so that is the end of slides. Um, thank you to Ian, who originally made the slides. Um, and uh, apologies if you came because you're an Ian Massingham uh, fan, and I am not. <laughs> I am not Ian Massingham. I did wear my Ian Massingham hoodie though, so hopefully that hopefully that gets us close enough. So I'll take questions now, um, or if not, I'll take questions uh, up here right after the fact, uh, and then after a short break, we'll be back with with part two. Thanks, everyone. Um, so the question was repeating if you're on Twitch was, would it be fair to describe Lambda as a, as a function, as a service? Um, I think that's, it's, a, it's a pithy way of putting it. Um, I think one of the use cases for, I think one of the use cases for Lambda is definitely, yeah, that you can use functions as a, as a service. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's, it's kind of more and also different than that. So, I have a lot of jobs that I would maybe use Lambda for, so cron or notifications that I wouldn't really consider functions as an actual service, but Lambda is still, is still awesome for. So yes, um, clever description of one of the use cases, um, but it's, it's that and also some different things as, as well. So uh, yes. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, you said that there's a limit of every 300 seconds in Lambda functions. Yeah. What's the advice behind like that? Um, so repeating the question for people that are on Twitch, um, I mentioned using Lambda as a replacement for, for cron, uh, but a lot of cron jobs are quite long running. Um, what would be the advice? I see Adrian raising his hand to answer this. I'm going to give my answer first, and then if Adrian wants to jump in, uh, he can. Um, <laughs> My answer, as it is to probably a lot of things, is that I tend to use Lambda for smaller, uh, uh, smaller cron replacements. So just do this thing in response to something else. Um, for a long running job, um, my personal answer would probably to go to, to ECS, and I would use I would use start task. So I would run that task in response to something else, and maybe Lambda still. Maybe I still use Lambda as the entry point. So I have a couple different options. And in one of them, Lambda says, actually, no, for this kind of job, uh, I'm going to send it to ECS. And I'll, call, I'll invoke start task. And I'll run it on my pool of ECS resources in my cluster pool. Uh, but for the other use cases, maybe Lambda will just handle itself and say, OK, well, this is quick. I'll run this, and I'll update this. So I would probably, I'd probably use a combination there. I'm a big fan, by the way, of using whatever you can uh, with the resources you have without using new ones. So if I have, if I have an ECS pool and I'm using it for high availability, um, so I have some extra resources to scale up and down, but unless I'm very special, I'm probably not using all my resources at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is frequently when, when cron jobs run. So why not use that capacity that I want anyway in case I need to scale up? So it's, it's unused, but it's there for a purpose. I would probably just use that extra capacity to run some long running uh, jobs and then use Lambda to handle the smaller ones. So I use Lambda a lot like glue. So not the actual glue, but like uh, function glue. So do this thing in response to something else. And one of those things, in some cases, might be kicking off an ECS task to run a longer running job. Um, if Adrian has something to add, he's saying no. <laughs> I'm narrating for Twitch. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm on Twitch a lot. So <laughs> um, if there are any other questions here, we're happy to take them. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, hello. Is it possible to debug a running function? Not, not so um, are you talking about atta like attaching a debugger to a function that's executing? Uh, 
Um, so repeating the question for, for Twitch, um, is there any way to attach a debugger to a, to a, like a running Lambda function to see what's going on? Um, there is the traditional, the traditional logging, and you'll also see log output while you're running your function. So you should be able to see pretty much what's going on uh, while your function is actually running. Um, about attaching uh, a debugger to the invoking function, I'm not sure. But I know you can see logs. Adrian? Yeah, very often people use uh, local, uh, local environments. There's a lot of actually uh, local tests, but for different environments, whether it's local tests for Node.js or Python, the language of Another thing which I saw talk to me a lot is hijack the logging and send in real time uh, information to that piece of what happens in the function so that they can debug. So to, to recap Adrian's answer for those of you that are listening uh, in on Twitch, uh, it's the middle of the night for the US, which is probably, <laughs> Twitch is usually people, <laughs> seems to always be the people that are like hanging out in Seattle and San Francisco, and I think they are very much asleep. Um, but if you're watching on Twitch or if you're watching the recap later, Adrian says that, uh, so yeah, so beyond the, the CloudWatch uh, kind of log integration off the bat, uh, some people uh, will just kind of hijack the logging, so they'll send their, lo their logs to like uh, Elasticsearch. Um, but uh, a pretty strong use case for people doing their debugging locally. So if you have to actually attach something to the running function, um, there's people use local environments for that, do their debugging, and then you get the, the standard uh, kind of CloudWatch logs uh, once, you're, once you're up in Lambda. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, repeating the question for those of you on Twitch, um, it was pointed out that I did not cover uh, chatbot services or the echoes uh, during the session this morning. Um, I left them out because we've had a couple of what I think Alexa uh, echo heavy sessions the last couple of weeks. Um, so I think they've done a better uh, illustration of, of, of Echo and Lex than I probably can. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people do use, do use Lambda for the, for the, the chatbot services as well. Um, if you're looking for specific details, I think Boaz or Adrian might be able to help better because um, I, don't, I don't work with Lambda as much as some people. Um, but in general, you're kind of using it like you would for anything else, right? Like you're, you have data coming from somewhere else and you're using Lambda to either invoke something or to update the data uh, for, your, for your chatbot response. So I don't have... I don't, didn't include architecture diagrams and stuff like that. Uh, there are a bunch online, um, or uh, maybe Adrian or, or Boaz would be happy to talk a little bit more offline after this. Yeah? From a cost perspective, they say you have the same function running on a, an EC2 instance or a Lambda. Approximately what sort of time per month, uh, over to two days, do you trigger the, the financial threshold where it's better to just run your own standalone instance or use Lambda functions? Um, so, Repeating the question, I think, if I understood it correctly for those on Twitch, it's if you're running a function on EC2 uh, and you're running a function on Lambda, at what, at what point is it more cost effective to run your EC2 instance uh, rather than the Lambda functions? Um, I'm not sure I know the number off the top of my head, but I, I figure that it would probably t take into account how long your function actually takes to run also. So, and what kind of data you're doing with it. So I imagine the threshold is probably pretty different depending on what your function's doing. Um, but, so I, I don't think I could quote you a hard number at what point uh, is it more cost effective to use EC2. I think that's maybe a more individual answer than I could give for a whole group. Uh, Adrian. To add something on that, there's also three tiers. One's median implication of that function is free for the month forever. Oh, yeah, we did talk about the free tier. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, repeating for those on Twitch, um, Adrian added that there's there's also a pretty extensive free tier, which I put back up in the in the slides. Um, you get a million invocations, so uh, that probably skews the numbers uh, a little bit on when it's more cost effective to run something on uh, on EC2. Um, but beyond what we just said, a, a lot of that's going to be pretty individual, right? So how long? What what is your function actually doing? But it, it depends. Yeah. Um, my understanding, and someone can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Oh, wait. So I'm repeating the question first for Twitch. Um, so the question was, I have, I have infrastructure on-prem. Um, can I invoke Lambda directly, uh, or can, uh, can I use it? Do I have to go through something like API Gateway? Uh, my understanding is that there are two kind of ways to use Lambda. One is Lambda at Edge, uh, which is at the, like, the CloudFront locations. Uh, and one is the Lambda service in AWS. Uh, I th think you'd probably go through API through API Gateway or something something similar. Uh, the same way, really, that you do uh, for IO. So using Lambda as an IoT backend uh, is really popular. The same kind of thing. So you send your data in, it goes through something else, and then Lambda performs actions on it. Yeah. So currently, it's not. Um, I'm sorry, you spoke very fast, and I uh, didn't. If I want to make it, if I don't want to use public endpoints in API Gateway, currently it's impossible. Um, to the, to the, so, so the, sorry. If, if, I, if I don't want to expose public endpoints yeah. in my API Gateway, so I want to just do kind of use for one purposes, I don't want to go through the internet, so is it possible as of now? Um, so repeating the question for people on Twitch, um, wants to know if it's, does not believe it's possible to expose public and to use API Gateway without exposing public endpoints. Uh, I, that is correct. I do not. I do not believe you can use API Gateway without exposing public endpoints. Um, any other questions for here? Or we'll be hanging around afterwards. Or if if everyone's finished, um, you can join me in like ten minutes for part two. So we'll talk about serverless architecture patterns uh, and Lambda again. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>